Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're trying to build an online business or you wanna set up a nice little space to show off your creative skills with the portfolio, or even if you wanted to just put together a creative gift, there are so many ways to take advantage of a web page. And Squarespace makes it as easy as possible. They have a huge variety of templates, fonts, color palettes, everything you need to show off your unique style without it being overwhelming. And it doesn't just stop at looks. You can take advantage of their behind the scenes analytics to see where your customers or viewers are coming from. They can pull all your social media accounts into one hub and help send out any messages or advertisements or whatever you have from one convenient spot and give you any notification from any of those websites there as well. Everything you need to build a proper marketing strategy to help you grow as a creator or as a business or really whatever you want. It's never been this easy to mark your place in the digital frontier. Go take a look for yourself. I've only mentioned a handful of features they offer. You can get a free trial going over at squarespace.com, and if you want to take the plunge, head over to squarespace.com slash gameapologist and get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to it. Welcome to yet another show on this channel. Comic Bunga. There are a lot of different canons for Ninja Turtles, especially when it comes to the comics, and this series is going to help make sense of all of them. If you're a regular to this channel, you probably know I cover a lot of Sonic stuff, and that's not changing. I do dearly love that franchise, but if there was one series I loved above any other, it would have to be the Ninja Turtles. Haven't talked about it a great deal since those videos don't seem to grab a lot of attention. If you needed more proof that the Turtles own my life, just look around my game room and long overdue shout out to Zubair. We spent months trying to grab me this promotional TMNT poster from his local Australian Pizza Hut. That's what I consider art. And he even sent me a super lovely note. I'm not sure if we read that in the Discord server or not. Zubair, if we haven't, let me know. We'll get that out. You're an absolute legend, man. Thank you. But yeah, as you can tell from my amazing decorating skills, I got swept up by Turtle Mania back in the early 90s, and I've never truly recovered. I've been asked on many occasions to cover more of the comic side of things for the Turtles, similar to what we do with Sonic, and coincidentally, both properties currently share the same publisher, and occasionally, they even share the same talent, as well as names of their furry female rebellion leaders. IDW Turtles is the new Archie Sonic, and we will cover all of that sooner rather than later, but before we do any of that, I think it's long overdue to talk about the very beginning. The Ninja Turtles are a multimedia property with fans that fell in love with them through cartoons, movies, games, toys, but before any of that, they started off as a comic. A parody comic. Because of course it was. Just listen to that name. It's absolutely ridiculous that the words Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles flow so beautifully together, but damn it they do, and they're a household name. But Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman didn't put this idea together with the intention of becoming one of the most iconic children's properties of all time. This original comic wasn't even made for kids. This took inspiration from all of their favorite comic series back in the day, but Kevin specifically was a huge fan of Frank Miller. And if you're familiar with his work, well, you know, before he went nuts, then you'll see a lot of Ronin and Daredevil in the art and story. And while this one comic would eventually lead to the wider cast of characters and stories, for a little while in 1984, there was only this single issue. And this would serve as the basis for practically every other version of the Ninja Turtle origin story going forward. So even if you've never read this first comic, if you're a fan of any other Turtle team, you're likely familiar with the broad strokes of this story, especially if you've seen the original 1990 movie or the 2003 For Kids show, both of which probably draw the most from this original series. But don't get me wrong, it's everywhere in the 2012 show, and who can forget Turtles Forever? Even hiring Shadow the Hedgehog to voice Leonardo. I strike two on my way down. Donatello takes out a third with his staff. There you go, Sonic fans. You got something out of this video. Where's that? Damn, fourth Chaos Emerald. Both Turtles Forever and the later cameo they would make in the 2012 show did a great job alluding to how hardcore these turtles are without actually showing the intense violence. And buddy, you better believe it, there is a lot of violence. I mean, just look at their original logo. It's Leonardo's bloody sword. Have you ever seen the word turtles taken so seriously before? Now, there are a number of ways you can check this out. Obviously, it's going to be a little challenging getting an original print of the first issue, but it has been re 
released to various degrees of success over the years, and IDW has done a great job making it available today. It was originally released in black and white, and some of the reprints do a terrible job showing off that art and its great detail, but early on they did color these up, and I think they did a pretty decent job, and you can actually read all of this for yourself for free without going to any skeezy websites by just checking out the color classics over on Google Books. They let you preview pages of most comics in there, but this collection actually gives you the entire first issue without ever needing to buy anything. Don't know if Comixology does the same thing or not. Haven't used them in a while. I really don't like their new format. I'll leave a link in the description if you're interested, but I think we've waffled on enough. Let's get into the story proper. This is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one. The first page kicks off with a close-up of Leonardo and a text box next to his face letting you know that he will be narrating the story, or at least the first part of the story. And it's as grim and as noirish as you could hope for. Like this line right here. I sense his body quivering with tense energy, waiting to be triggered into a savage slashing release. Wait, hold on. What the hell am I reading? He and his brothers are cornered by the Purple Dragon Gang. Their back's up against a wall. And while it sounds like they're backed up into a corner and it sounds like they might be in trouble, you take one look at them and... Yeah, I think they're gonna be fine. I'm gonna tell you right now, the art is a little all over the place in this book, and that's because Eastman and Laird try to share every single responsibility that would come with making a comic. Scripting, storyboarding, pencils, inking, everything was shared. They're both supremely talented, and we would not have this franchise without both of them being present. And while I do think they did a fantastic job not only emulating that grimy style that you would find with a lot of Frank Miller's work back in the day, taking something that's generally considered sloppy art and and then turning that itself into its own art form. Even that considered a lot of the human faces just, well, they just look amateurish. I know Miller's later stuff really kind of falls off a ledge, but early on he could really do something special with that messy line work of his. And I think a lot of that is thanks to how he portrays his characters. Ugly lines help portray ugly emotions. Again, I know it's easy to dog on his later work, but seriously, go back and check out his early stuff. It is truly beautiful. When I look at the human characters in in old school Ninja Turtles, my first thought is, yeah, this is somebody trying to copy Frank Miller and not doing a great job at it. That is until you get to the turtles themselves. Here in these designs, we do see all of those influences, but on this very first page, they have made something truly unique, something unlike anything else on the market, even if this is a parody book. You can tell a lot of love and care went into the designs of the four main brothers, and really that's where the priority should be. It's it's very rare for any future interpretation of the turtles to stray too far away from this core design. And don't get me wrong, I like some of those wild variations, but right here on page one we are shown exactly what a ninja turtle is. The grimace, the weapons, the bandanas, they look absolutely fantastic. And as the fight with the purple dragons kicks off, the turtles leap into action, jumping over the big, bold Eastman and Laird's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles logo. It's no wonder so many of these pieces of dynamic art would become iconic in the comic book community and in the franchise itself going forward. I've seen this first splash page recreated in so many different ways and I'm just so incredibly impressed they nailed this so unbelievably hard right out of the gate. Leonardo narrates the entire fight telling us how tough the purple dragons are but no matter what they've come up against in the past they've never seen anything quite like the ninja turtles and they're not ready for them. Even if these dudes have guns they are no match for old school ninja weapons. Weapons that are properly used, mind you. This is not like future cartoons. These aren't robots. Raphael just straight up stabs a couple of dudes. And again, look at these poses. God, this is beautiful. The fight only lasts a few pages, but they do a great job showing how dumb of an idea it would be to pick a fight with these four giant reptiles. After they murder what are probably a bunch of teenagers, they split the crime scene as the cops are arriving, saying that they don't like to run from people they would consider allies, but they probably wouldn't understand them. And yeah, no, cops probably wouldn't be too happy with a bunch of slaughtered people. Then again, they are the cops. Maybe they do. Who can say? But yeah, the scene ends with the four boys slipping into the sewer with Leo, who has been bragging about their mad skills this entire time, saying they strike hard.
hard and fade away into the night. And yeah, buddy, they do. That first fight showed us just how little nonsense these boys put up with. They ain't here for a pizza party. They're here to murder your ass. And we'll say this is where part one ends. It doesn't technically actually have a part one. It just jumps straight to the next scene. And we do still follow up from Leonardo's perspective, but only for the first two panels. And that's as they're entering their hidden sewer lair. And I actually like how it's done here. It's hidden behind a brick wall. And inside is a surprisingly well-furnished room where Splinter is awaiting their return. The boys report that they murdered 15 people and Splinter's like, oh, great. It's finally time I tell you where you guys come from. And the next portion of the comic is the actual origin of the Ninja Turtles as told by Splinter. Now, right off the bat, this is where one of the major differences in the origin story comes into play. Depending on the canon, Splinter either starts off as the human being Hamato Yoshi or his pet rat. In this rendition, he starts off as a pet rat, one who would mimic the movements of Yoshi, and that's how he learned Ninjutsu. And keep in mind, this is before he was ever mutated. Then again, rats are much smarter than people usually give them credit for, so who knows? Who am I to stop them from achieving their dreams of becoming Hokage? Anyway, Splinter goes on to explain a lot of important Ninja Turtle lore, including the famous Foot Clan, which obviously is a parody of the hand from Marvel Comics, and they don't try to sugarcoat it at all. Splinter says that they are straight up the most feared warriors and assassins in all of Japan. Then he goes on to mention another member of the foot, Oroku Nagi. Yeah, that might be throwing some of you off. You might be expecting me to say Saki, but no, Oroku Nagi. This is a character that usually gets left out of Ninja Turtle lore, and you will find out why in just a little bit. Yoshi and Nagi competed fiercely in all things, especially for the love of a young woman, Tang Shen. One night, Nagi just straight up busted into Shen's home. He beat her after she denied his advances, saying that she only loved Yoshi. And that's all portrayed here in this panel where she's nearly naked. Very classy. Yoshi walks in while this is happening, and in a blind rage, he beats Oroku Nagi to death. Yoshi had killed another member of the Foot Clan, and as you can imagine, that's a big no-no, leaving him with only a couple of options. One, he could take his own life and hope for honor in the next one, or flee with Shen to another country and try to start things off fresh. He chose the latter, fleeing to New York with Shen and Splinter in tow, and in time he managed to form his own small martial arts school. But while Yoshi and Shen were building a new life together in America, back in Japan, Nagi's death was being mourned by his little brother, Oroku Saki, who at this point was just a seven-year-old child, one filled with vengeance and hate towards Yoshi. And the foot took advantage of that. They used that to help intensively train the boy for their own purposes, and eventually he would grow to surpass his teachers. And the more he grew, so too did his hate towards Yoshi. At 18 years old, he had become the most cunning assassin in the foot, and the most obvious choice to lead their new branch in New York. And I love that his hairstyle completely changes from panel to panel here. <laughs> but yeah, Saki took advantage of his newfound status and used the foot to start drug smuggling, arms running, a whole bunch of nasty things in the name of the foot, and also took on the moniker of Shredder. And when the time was right, he finally tracked down Hamato Yoshi. Shredder found his apartment, tore the place apart, and killed Tang Shen. And when Yoshi finally came home, Shredder gave him just enough time to see their horror in front of his eyes. And when the shocked Yoshi asked him who he was, Shredder responded only with, I am Oroku Saki. All Yoshi says in response is, oh no. Instantly realizing who Shredder was and why he was here. And that's all the Shredder needs. And with one swift slice of his blades, he kills Yoshi. And look, I'm gonna be real with you here. If Shen wasn't involved, the poor girl got the raw end of the stick this entire time. She got beaten, she got murdered, it's miserable. But if she was not involved, could you really blame Shredder for being this pissed off with Yoshi? I mean, the dude killed his brother, and Shredder just rolls up, ruins this dude's life, and in an instant, takes him out. Shredder planned his revenge for well over a decade, made a name for himself, got his own branch of the business up and running, got a crazy costume and a name that he expected people to call him, and they did, then rolls up to Yoshi's crib and gives the dude all of five seconds to realize his life is completely ruined and doesn't give any grand villain a speech. No crap like that. Just name drops? And before Yoshi can even finish saying, oh shit, ends the dude right there. Years of planning just for that one quick moment. That's hardcore. Just again, you know, it's a shame all that wife murdering had to happen. <clears throat> Anyways, 
Splinter carries on from there, saying that he survived the night. His cage had been smashed and he was free, left to wander the streets. Because, oh no, what's a rat to do in New York City? How will he ever survive? But one day he witnessed an accident. An old blind man was crossing the street and was almost hit by a giant truck. But at the last second, he is saved by a young man, and the comic goes out of its way to really emphasize a mysterious canister that gets knocked out of the truck and hits the young guy in the face. This is alluding to the origin of Daredevil. Pretty much saying in this one comic that Daredevil and the Ninja Turtles all exist in the same universe and the same chemicals that blinded Matt Murdock, mutated Splinter, and the Turtles instead of, you know, just blinding a bunch of baby turtles. But yeah, from there, the origin is pretty much the same as it is in almost every version of the story. A bunch of baby turtles accidentally get knocked into the sewer, they get splashed by a mysterious ooze, Splinter collects them, and fairly quickly, all five of them begin to mutate. Splinter, already being a grown rat, raises the four mutated baby turtles, teaches them ninjutsu, and names them after famous renaissance artists from a book that he had grabbed out of a storm drain. All of that stuff remains the same. What is different this time around is why Splinter teaches them ninjutsu. It is all for revenge. At this point, he is old, and actually, when I think about it, Oroku Saki was seven when his brother died, and even if Splinter was somehow born that day, Saki did not show up till he was at least 18 years old. That would make Splinter at the very minimum 11 years old prior to his mutation, which is far longer than any rat can live. God, this book is so unrealistic. I can't believe it. But yeah, Splinter is old as crap, so he can't take out the Shredder himself, so he raised these four turtles to do the job for him. And he says he must ask them to do which no bean should ever ask of another, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. And the turtles are just like, yeah, right, that's cool. From here, we have another jarring shift in narrators, as we are now following Raphael, who looks exactly like Leonardo, just with different weapons. And here we have this beautiful piece with him perched over the side of a building, then leaping across the roofs of New York until he finally reaches the headquarters of the foot. Splintered had tasked him with infiltrating the headquarters and leaving a calling card. And his calling card is going to be, what else? Murder. He hops in and kills the living crap out of three cards. He then spots Saki next to a window and decides he's going to wrap a message around one of his sighs. And he does just that, aiming right for the dude who manages to deflect the thing. I don't know if that's supposed to be impressive, but that looks absolutely ridiculous. Saki was trying to sell some businessmen on the protection of the Foot Clan. This, of course, cuts that deal short, which Shredder isn't happy with, but is even more pissed off once he reads the note, which is basically saying meet me and the boys in the parking lot after school ends. And I love that the Shredder is basically like, why is this dude sending his lackeys after me? Doesn't he know who I am? But fine, if they want to die, I'm happy to kill him. So the next night, we follow the turtles as they climb up onto the roof of an abandoned building, calling out Shredder, who is perched on an adjacent building like a spiky Spider-Man, wondering who the hell these people are and why they're bothering him after something he sorted out 15 years ago. And he makes a grand entrance, saying, I am here, come face your doom, and calls upon his foot clan. From there, a huge fight breaks out, the turtles first taking on the clan themselves, and it's far more brutal than the fight with the dragons. The foot are far more efficient fighters, and the turtles are getting all kinds of cut up, but they're returning the favor tenfold. And soon enough, they have wiped out all of the foot ninja. And Shredder is impressed. He says that those are his best men, but points out they still manage to leave their mark as the turtles are cut up and bloody all over, which just makes this next part even more embarrassing for the Shredder. A fight breaks out and Shredder holds his own against the four pretty efficiently, one by one, knocking them to the side. Raphael, then Donatello, Michelangelo, and finally setting his sights on Leonardo. But unlike his brothers, Leo does not get shoved to the side. He instead takes his two katana and slices Shredder across the chest. And from here, the fight takes a turn. Leo directs his brothers to change up tactics. He's too good to face in one-on-one -on -one competition. And they're not here for a fair fight. They're here to kill this dude. So he instructs his brothers to strike at once and from a distance. The boys chuck ninja stars, knives, and finally Raph throws his twin side, throwing Shredder off and getting into a straight up fist fight with the dude. Donnie comes up from behind, smacking him in the back with the bow and then across his face, taking off the mask. But Shredder manages to kick him aside. But Leo comes back in and shoves a sword 
through Shredder's chest. The fight is over. <laughs> Leo stands over the Shredder, crumpled, holding his wound, demanding that they finish him off. But Leo says they are turtles, not dogs without honor. He then offers Shredder his sword so he has a chance to die with honor and commit seppuku. Just a reminder, one of the largest children's franchises in the world. But Shredder refuses, saying that if he has to go, he's taking the turtles out with him and pulls out a thermite grenade. This is enough to wipe off the rooftop. But before he can even chuck the grenade, Donnie throws his bow staff, which nails Saki right in his face, sending him over the side of the roof with the grenade in tow. Dude has been stabbed through the guts, taking a bow staff which has destroyed his face, has fallen off a roof, and if that wasn't disrespectful enough, his corpse then gets blown to smithereens by his own grenade. That's right, Shredder dies in the very first issue of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and not only dies, but gets straight up cremated. This dude is four kinds of dead. And the turtles watch it all happen. They ain't about to turn away from all this. They have trained their entire sentient lives for this one mission, this one moment, and they aren't phased in the slightest. But hey, Leo does manage to crack one joke as they come across a little bit of Shredder's armor, and all Leo can say is, hmm, it seems the Shredder has been shredded. And like Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi, he just chucks it behind him without a care in the world. And the comic ends with that same iconic sentence that closed up Act 1. We are the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We strike hard and fade away into the night. The end. So yeah, a lot of this stuff has been recycled over and over and over. And truth be told, it took me a very long time to actually read this very first issue. Because what was the point? Outside of the goofy cartoon, I had watched the movie. The 2003 show recreated pretty much everything from the Mirage run. But man, even considering all the recycled origin story we would see in just about every iteration of the Turtles, even if this is showing a lot of amateurish art and story choices. Even if this was made to be a parody that's not supposed to be taken super seriously, this was still an awesome read. Of course, with hindsight, you can understand why they made the changes they did. If you think about it, Splinter and the Turtles, they're not good people. They're just in it for revenge and they murder a lot of folks on their way to kill this one dude. And they don't fight fair. Now, that's not to say Shredder is a good person, not by any stretch of the imagination. And I also thought it was kind of weird that he was not phased at all when he was facing off against four mutant turtles. But this was just a war between two very violent factions that were fueled exclusively by revenge. And to be completely fair, a lot of ninja in media are portrayed as honor bound and all this other crap. And honestly, a lot of that's probably thanks to what the ninja turtles would become. But at least here in the early days, this comic is at least a a little bit more honest with what a real ninja would actually be. They were spies, they were infiltrators, they were murderers, they were mercenaries. They were not considered honorable. Quite the opposite. So yeah, these boys are a far cry from the heroes they would eventually become. And to be fair, in this own canon, they would evolve quite a bit as the story would carry on. But when you consider just how brutally demolished the Shredder was, it's pretty obvious they packed as much as they could in this 140 page story. The original intention was not to make a long-running series. This was a wild and silly parody concept, first and foremost. There's barely any characterization for anybody on display here. You can't tell one turtle from the other. The most we get is that Raph likes the outdoors a little bit more than his brothers, and the more centralized focus on Leo shows us that he's probably a little bit more capable than the other four turtles, but regardless, they are all still hardcore and will murder you dead. We are a far cry from the far more defined personalities that would make these boys so iconic. But even lacking a lot of these ever important elements of the franchise, there is still so much here that they got right in the very first issue. And I think from that perspective, this makes this all the more enjoyable. Trying to look at this from somebody who has never heard of the Ninja Turtles before. Trying to see what captured the imaginations of the folks in the mid-80s. Yeah, obviously, the franchise blew 
blew up thanks to the 87 cartoon, but there still had to be something there to stir up that initial interest, and clearly there was. The Turtles did indeed strike hard, but man, they sure as hell didn't fade away, and we're all the better for it. But yeah, guys, I've been rambling about this one single issue for long enough. I hope you had a good time. I certainly did. And let me know if you want any more Turtle stuff on the channel. Should we continue with Mirage? Should we move on to some of the shows? Should we cover more of the games? Should I put another video out there on YouTube talking about how criminally underrated Rise of the Team and T is? Because holy crap, is it ever? There is so much to talk about in my favorite franchise, and I would love an excuse to revisit this topic. But hey, thank you so much for watching this video, and a massive shout out to all the patrons who've been supporting me, with an extra, extra special thank you to these fine folks here. Kyle Winter, Cirrus the Skeptic, Joseph Duncan Sonic 2 Blue, John, Josh Strider, Teenage Monroe Ninja Casey, Faison Razul, Xanderoni the Painter, Hatsworth, Tiny Jericho, Ginger Bob, Jack of All Spades, Tristan Trap, Meekers, Dun Dun, Quote, Resident Fanboy, Miles the Prower, Jeremy Singer, Mr. Bujay, World's Greatest Bard, Sam Webster, Dwight Graham, Fishflop, Lucas Lipker, The Bad Pal, Jonathan Dobbs, Mr. Dr. SP, Dr. Pending, Cecil the Glade, The Dark Neon, Stefan Plakonica, Three Monic, Graham J. Hall, Lenny X, Wayne is Boss, Jamie Chevalier, Lederick, On the First Day of Christmas, Game Apologist just gave to me 20 window covers, so I am now David 20 window covers, Toot Toot Coriate. You guys always with the long names. Jimmy Duke STR, The Lumberjack. Today's video isn't sponsored by Raycon brand wireless earbuds featuring 10 hours of battery life and a 30 foot Bluetooth wrench. <laughs> Otis, you're gonna get me in so much trouble. NBTV, Mute, Trash Baphomet, Autumn from Twitter.com, That Pyromane, Hopeful for the New Year, and Waiting for Icky Nicky to play Xenoblade Chronicles. You know what, Pyra? I'm genuinely waiting to play that as well. I hope I find the time. I hear nothing but good things about that series. And apparently there's a big emphasis on a turtle in the second one. I don't know. That's enough of an excuse to get me to play it. Jin Seotome, Nezend, Enerjack 5, Grayson Conagher, Spades the Nocturne, Ken K, Then 101, Paxton Bisbee, Sindarin 7, Stevie Cole, Where's Arnold, 3 Rule 4, Twilord, A Seer of Warrens of a Deadly Fate, Paisley, Eric Delgado, Cody Gracious, Kodinsky, Jamo Art, PK Durbar, Crimson Rose, give up your children, separate, Sonic P-A-J, Moon is, look, look, if I just read it as words, it says Moon Nine Cent. So is it Moon Nine Cent? I just, I need to know. Zagard Lagan, just reiterating, this video isn't sponsored by Raycon brand earbuds and you shouldn't visit buyraycon.com and enter code Boucher. Oh my God. Roxas the Cat, Godzilla, Makuta of Salt, Gleam the Anomaly, Jonathan, Alexander Watson, Calais Presley, Native Nerd 27, Neil Gompa, Conan Kudo, Sharif Pai, Aeon3 Valifor, and Infamous.jpg. I saw some of you guys comment that it just tickles you pink when you have your name read out. So yeah, as long as the name read is, if it's making you happy, then I'm happy to do it. But some of you really got to tell me how to pronounce these names. I'm struggling so hard on a couple of these every time, and I have yet to be told if I'm doing it correctly or not. So get on that. That's your money at work here. But seriously, guys, thank you so so, so, so much for your help here. And hey, if you're mostly here for the Sonic stuff, don't you worry. We're going to be going in hard for Sonic Frontiers in January. And I'll be starting up Archie speed reading pretty soon as well. I think we're going to do one more speed reading to get us caught up with what's going on in IDW. But after that, I think it's about time we got into Archie Sonic proper. So stay tuned for that. And of course, yes, I will be talking about Klonoa and other things when I can. I've got to be very careful when I drop videos I know aren't going to do super good. YouTube is very mean to videos like that. But that is enough rambling. That's enough behind the scenes nonsense from me. Once again, thank you so much, and I will catch you all later. Cowabunga, dudes and dudettes.